All right, five minutes passed. Um, there are probably a few more coming in. So the um, webinar uh, today is for practitioner, for professional, facilitator, and it's about leadership related to somatic consent. There's a recording today. So I make sure that the recording is, um, that there is no personal information of you in there. And um, normally I as well try to cut it that there are no faces to be seen. So that you're sure that the recording that I sent around, um, that you're not in that recordings. Okay. Um, so I invite you for a few moments to just close your eyes, just arrive here. Take a few deep breaths. And I imagine as you all facilitator and practitioner, you have your own ways of facilitating yourself. What I like to share is just breathing out till the end of the out breath. Till inhaling is just happen naturally. And then let your inhale just fill up your lung. <sighs> and then give it a sigh if you like, if you need to, if you want. And another exhale to the end of the out breath. Till breathing just happens. <sighs> and give it a sigh. So I work in this with some metacognitive moments. When you're ready, please open your eyes. And that's the first little lesson I would like to put in is when we do that all together, or when you do that with a client, or when you do that with a group, when you inhale to the end, when you exhale to the end of the out breath, and then you're inhaling and exhaling with a sigh, what you literally do is you self-regulate your nervous system. And when you do that all together, you self-regulate together. So you co-regulate in a group environment. And um, that's for every staff, for everything, absolutely beneficial. So first of all, thanks and appreciation for each one of you showing up here today. Um, it, it's, it's Stockholm, it's an amazing weather. And uh, it's about 30 degrees. The sun is out since a few days. And uh, I really acknowledge you being here. I don't know how the summer is where you are here. It's amazing. So just want to let you know, thank you for showing up. Um, would I rather be at the lake somewhere in nature? Hmm. No, I'm actually really passionate about that work. And I'd rather be here and just share today. There have been a few moments where I'd rather be on the lake than expressing or sharing my gifts at a festival or something. But now I'm really happy to be here and uh, I'm happy to have you all here today. So it's very exciting. This is pretty much since last November, my first practitioner gathering. So I've been out of practitioner mode for quite a while and then Corona happens and I imagine each one of you, as your professional, you have been affected by uh, the lockdown and by the um, uh, kind of distancing of people. Uh, so I have, and um, that it's, can be quite devastating, specifically when we are dependent on uh, physical connection or touch when we when we body work. So what I would like to share today is. Um, the path of empowerment 
a little bit about the polyvagal theory, the nervous system, how that all works and fits together in the somatic consent engagement system. And um, how to be empowered and empower others. And um, we go about half an hour, something like that, um, where we share some, or where I share some keynote slices and we go into question and answers. And um, if you having any questions in between, you can write them anytime in the, in the chat box. Just write a big Q or question mark or whatever makes it a question. And uh, as far as I see, you can actually as well write privately to other people in here. So feel free if you know some familiar faces to say hello, good to see you. Hey, I oh, you know you from that one. So please feel free to communicate if it's okay with you. Um, anything else that I think to share here? Yeah, no, that's pretty much it. So this webinar is as well um, to give you an overview, not only about the somatic consent work and the work that I share is as well an invitation for two workshops that I have been coming up. Um, one of them is um, 16th of July in Stockholm. The other one is 19th of August in Berlin. Um, I will post at the end the links um, at the end, I send you as well um, a link for the free downloadable student handbook. I'm very excited about that one. So that you can kind of read and watch some videos and get some maps and pictures about that. And um, furthermore, I will share my um, Calendly link because um, I offer as well supervision sessions for practitioners and online sessions for individuals as well. If you're in Stockholm and would like to join for a private one-on-one -on -one session, I'm available for sessions here as well. So I sent you some links and you choose which of the information is important for you. And if none of this is resonating with you, then please don't copy them. So um, as I said, this is recorded. At the end, um, when I have edited all, I send to everybody who has signed up to this webinar the recording link. And if you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to reach out at any time. So, um, everybody okay? Ready to get it started? Great, okay, wonderful. So, I'm excited. Uh, I feel actually a little bit nervous. See, it's nice, so I just hear that in my voice. I have a dry mouth and, um, and one of the first important pieces in that is to acknowledge that. And an important piece is as well that even if I've done, I don't know, thousands of sessions over the years, that this is before I go in a session every time the same. And I thought on one place, you know, will that change one day? And if I'm just really embodied, if, if I'm just really professional and confident, then, then I'm just sitting there like a rock and everything is solid. Uh, does it resonate? The more I deeper I go, the more, the more subtle it gets, the more vulnerable I get, and the, the, the finer the vibration, the finer the insecurity gets. And... I was fighting that in the beginning. I was just thinking now as a practitioner, I have to be really kind of just tough. And I was neglecting that as a gift till I actually recognized when I'm before a session that this is a really good welcoming energy to get focused. And not only to get focused, it is as well a vibration or an energy that I can imagine depend on the kind of session that I'm offering, what kind of session the client is coming for and how they feel. So most of the time when I'm talking with clients before, when they come in, into a session and we have this first check-in and I ask them how you feel and sometimes I notice when they're overwriting this sensation, oh, you know, I'm cool, I'm good. Yeah, I feel really good. 
And I said, really? So just, just close your eyes for a moment and just check in, how do you really feel? And that all of your feelings are welcome. So don't change anything. You don't have to prove anything. So be as natural as you are. So I'm professional since about, as a, as a body worker, as a practitioner since 10 years. I started in 2010. Um, I've done different educations around body work um, over the years. The first thing that I did was a kind of a Tantra workshop. And uh, in this Tantra workshops, uh, people were saying, you know, when you offer a Tantra session, uh, you can literally do what you want because nobody knows what a tantra session is. <laughs> so that was the education starting <laughs> session work. And I noticed pretty fast that this is not it. And I was always good with my hands and I had always a good intuition and I could really tune in and feel into people. Um, and I noticed that there's more to it. Um, that somebody is... Uh, unmuted, please mute yourself. So um, then I uh, did some practitioner trainings with ISTA and, and Kodoshka and other bodywork trainings. And in one of the trainings, somebody gave me the, uh, a, a piece of paper with the wheel of consent. And there was no explanation about it. There was no talking about it. Just like, okay, you have to ask first <laughs> and then <laughs> you just do and I just saw that piece and just like ah just put it away and haven't really uh, paid much attention to it and then I just had another look onto it and saw that there was an option of I'm I'm doing something and it's for me so in this dynamic course you're in action and it's for you and I got intrigued by that and I start playing with this dynamics for about three years and I got really fucking confused. Because what the confusion was that when I was starting doing something to somebody for myself, I did that because I wanted to have their response so that their pleasure was my pleasure. I talk a little bit later about that, what I call the indirect route. So then in 2014, I met Betty Martin uh, in Like a Pro. And I learned about a dynamic that calls the direct route. So that action for my own benefit is the sensory inflow. So feeling for myself. And ever since I got totally hooked and I practiced that, and this is what I mainly teach today on a somatic level, but I got so inspired by the level of empowerment in my own nervous system that I could share that to people on a different level on a different frequency and it was really resonating with people and I was clicking it was clicking in so um, I did about in the last uh, six years of mentorship with Betty Martin I don't know 25 like a pros that I co-facilitated and facilitated I taught maybe 50 wheel of consent workshops and I've probably had 500 of sessions, just empowerment sessions where I let people find the sensory inflow and um, um, for them making choices. And then in 2017 or was even before, I can't really remember the dates, I learned about the polyvagal theory from Stephen Porges. Everybody have heard about that? This is where I would like to guide you in the next few minutes in. So how the nervous system works and to be trauma informed because, you know, as a tantric practitioner, I was thinking or as a, as a sex positive body worker, I was thinking that every, every human being is ecstatic when we just can tune into our potential of being sexual with ourselves and with others. And when I was in session and I was offering sexual healing sessions um, that, that I could just guide people pretty easy and fast into this dynamics. And I wasn't really fully aware of the depth that, of, of the depth of trauma people were carrying in their body. 
because I never had really trauma in my body. So I stick my nose into the polyvagal theory and PTSD and uh, 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 TRE. So I, I did different educations. I just met um, uh, um, Stephen Bocelli and did a TRE education. I met Stephen Porges and did some work around the polyvagal theory. Read, you know, all the books from Basil van der Kolk and. I just wanted to know, I just wanted to crack that nut about the nervous system. I'm super passionate about that. And what I found out then is that the difference between what I shared a few minutes ago about the direct and indirect route in our nervous system are really important. So that the direct route is the sensory inflow, what is my action from my own experience, what I let people find. But the indirect route, what I was kind of crucifying a little bit and making wrong, that I was only going for their pleasure as my pleasure to get gratification in the beginning, that this is a super important neurological um, wiring for a feedback loop that we need to get from clients when we work with them. So the indirect route, what I said, so you pleasure is my pleasure, is the secondary pathway in our nervous system to be, capable, uh, to be capable of tuning and fine tuning into clients and feeling where they are at. Where we can co-regulate with clients and where our, there's a specific part in the frontal lobe in the neocortex that is responsible for compassion and empathy is switched on where we literally can feel like the mirror neurons what's going on in the other person and that's key being a practitioner feeling into other people without putting our agenda onto them so letting them find what they're here for letting them find what their desire is letting them find what they want to get out of it, that session. That can be anything. So that I, as a practitioner, have learned it to get really out of my own way and being fully available for whatever shows up in the client. Does that resonate? Kind of, you know what I talk about? Okay, good. All right. Um, let's drop into the polyvagal theory. So who knows about the polyvagal theory? And who have poly what theory has no idea. Okay, so if you know about it, um, great, you might learn something new or something deeper. Or uh, if you haven't heard it, I make it as simple and easy as possible. Um, the developer of the polyvega theory, is Stephen Porges, he is a neurophysiologist from US. He is working at the uh, uh, university, I think in Illinois for neurophysiology and um, and the polyvagal theory has, been, theory has been revolutionizing the medical care system in the last 10 years. So um, fantastic stuff. And I tried to figure out how that stuff worked. So I just read his book three times and I found always something new. And, um, and then it just clicked in somehow. I just, I just got it. I had the picture in front of my eyes and just like, Oh my God, this is, this is how it is. Oh my God, this is just like, and I, I could combine that with what I have learned about the wheel of consent and what I share now with the somatic consent engagement system as a tool of empowerment. And then there came this quote into my mind from um, Albert Einstein who said, if you can't explain it simple enough, you have not understood it. And so at this, draw the picture and created a, a whiteboard animation and um, sent it to Porges and said, have I understood it right? Is it true? And he sent it back said, I'm amazed. That's fantastic. Please share. So I have this polyvega theory on my YouTube channel and you find that at the handbook at the end. So you find the picture and description and a link to this video. I don't know, there are probably at the moment 60,000 views on, on, or something like that. Please share it, just, just look it up. So this is what I would like to share next with you or what I would like to start with, the polyvagal theory. So I start sharing my screen. 
um, practitioners. So um, first of all, what I would like to share here is that I shared that already in sessions um, in relationship to the um, uh, somatic consent engagement system, where se sessions happens is in this place that I call the apex. So the apex is when you look on top from a pyramid, like from on top, you see this place here. So it is above, it's not within the dynamic, it's above the dynamic. And this is what I call the interpersonal space for sessions, so being in service. I have that here in a um, little bit um, more, um, in, in a bigger picture, kind of, we have the, the uh, shadows and the no agreements and no consent, then we have the base um, where we having self-care and where our limits and our boundaries getting expressed. And then we have the agreement and the permission lines where we engage with, let's say, with lovers. So this is how the three minute game where the wheel is original form got created uh, when two people play the three minute game. But in a session, you have to be a level higher than that because you are in a position of power and in this position of power, you have a higher level of responsibilities. So you cannot equally engage with a client in a session. So therefore you have to step above that through embodiment. So that was to that one. So the polyvagal theory, sorry, that was a little bit before that one. So the polyvagal theory is a hierarchical structured um, dynamic in the nervous system that is related to different parts in the brain. And it's from the top to a down system. And we as humans, we are social creatures and we engage our social engagement system first. So the social engagement system is the so-called ventral vagus nerve and that's how we, how we speak and making eye contact and how we hear people talking or seeing their physical expression. So if I would say in here right now, okay, so let's do a tantric online sex party. Let's get all naked and have a great sexual time together. You would probably kind of think, mm, nah, there's something not right here. I've not been signing up for that. So your nervous system would automatically go into a sh kind of a defensive mechanism. So the social engagement system is that part of our human structure, how we detect if we are safe or if we are not safe in the environment where we are in. And that's true for you, that's true for me, and that's true for every client and every person in the world. So the structure of the polyvagal theory is that we always engage the social connection first. So this, the second line um, in the polyvagal theory is the um, sympathetic one. So what is your limbic system or your animal, your feelings, your emotions, your irrational expression? Super important to express boundaries, saying no and using anger for being capable of saying no. And then you have the um, dorsal vagus, what is the parasympathetic related to your brainstem activity that is controlling your heartbeat, that's controlling your breath, your digestion when you sleep, is the oldest part of our nervous system. Paul just said we have inherited that from the turtles. Um, that might be true, I can't tell, but it's the reptilian part of, of, of our nervous system, of our brain. So the ventral vagus is everything from your diaphragm upwards. So your heart, your lungs, your vocal cord, your larynx, uh, your, there's a middle ear muscle, your um, uh, eye muscles, your tongue, you, you know, your facial expression is your ventral vagus. Um, and your dorsal vagus is everything below your diaphragm. So it just goes to all other organs and is, um, um, you cannot control that. It's involuntary. So um, 
as I said that in the social engagement system with the ventral vagus nerve, you determine in the environment where you're in, if you're either safe, so you're empowered, you're making choices, you play, you can be sensual, intimacy, connection, sex, or you are not safe. This is where oppression, storytelling, lying, manipulation and power over is happening. So where we power over others and we're getting overpowered. So it's where we, where we don't really engage. Yeah. Everybody knows what I talked about? Yeah, it's, it's pretty obvious. So when, you, when, when, for example, there is something happening in the environment between you and somebody else, it might be client, it might be anybody else in life, and or you say something or you do something and in your client's world, they're, they're getting triggered in not being safe. Their nervous system goes on survive mode. So they go into a fight, flight or hide mode. Their nervous system is detecting whatever it is as danger. And that pretty much, much depends on their history they have, the experience they have in their life, the package that they carry the personality structure they bring into your sessions in your work. And, um, and what, whatever that happens when a client is detecting danger in the environment they're in, um, there is no access to them. And you know, it just depends on what kind of sessions work you do. Um, some people working with high traumatized abused people and it just needs super fine-tuned capabilities of working with people who are in the danger, fight, flight, and hide mode. So if people cannot bring themselves back into the sense of safety when they are in danger, so in the sympathetic nervous system, their nervous system automatically goes down in shock, faint, and collapse. So Paul just is describing that as, you know, they're going into tensing their body. So it's just like they're on the one foot on the accelerator and the other foot um, on the brake till their body collapse and then they're, they're out. So they're, they're, they're faint or they collapse. And this is where literally trauma is getting stored in the body. And I've seen that in some kind of, spiritual and tantric communities that this has been made wrong to some degree so that there's something wrong about the nervous system but fact is that we just need to acknowledge that this is a really highly developed survival mechanism in our nervous system that we just need to appreciate and let in and making peace with it and making friends with it and that is um, harder to do than saying it but by trying to avoid that and making it wrong it's getting worse so important is that on this point the so the shock faint and collapse mechanism is important to acknowledge because it belongs to our nervous system for a good reason and the reason is that when we're getting eaten by the tiger that we don't feel pain and that the development of our structure to evolve as a human race has been going through this shock and faint mechanism in a bigger loop, in a bigger circle. So we, 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 we go through shock to evolve and develop as an important feature in the nervous system. Without that, um, we wouldn't be there where we are as a human race. So it belongs to the nervous system. So, however, when clients come to sessions, they might hang out in one of these places. Important is that you want to bring people out of that space. You don't want to bring them into that space. So, um, next step is here that when you are safe with a person, when you are in session with a person, and they're safe, you can, and it doesn't matter what the session is that you offer, that when you 
have enough connection or when you have enough engagement and you have an agreement about what's going to happen for how long, then the nervous system in a safe space goes automatically into mobilization. What is as well sympathetic. So in some descriptions, sympathetic has been described in the old um, uh, description of the nervous system. You know, you have, the, you have the parasympathetic, that's a good one, and you have the sympathetic, that's the bad one. And you just somewhere in between, you have the homeostasis, and this is where you try to be. And, and I never understood that in the nervous system. Fact is, the sympathetic is neither good nor bad. It's just our mobile state, and it's either safe or it's either not safe. So when people are safe, the body likes to go in any kind of physical activity and expression. And that might be dance, it might be yoga, sport, or work, or any kind of physicality. And the body needs that. I love all of this, yoga, dance, sport, work. Who else loves that? <laughs> I love it. And I imagine everybody loves that to a degree. So when we have exhausted ourselves, and when we have um, come to a point where we don't want to go further or deeper into physicality, then our nervous system goes further down into the space of, as well, dorsal parasympathetic. And that is called immobilization. And it is the same state in the nervous system, but safe. I call that the bliss state. It's rest, sleep, meditation, rejuvenation, um, um, uh, the void, uh, any kind of spiritual experiences um, happens down there in that state. The interesting part in here is that between the difference between the safe and the not safe state is in the safe state, your frontal lobe, your noticing part of your brain is activated and you have access to all layers simultaneously in any time you can speak in any time you can get mobile again in any time you can lay down and rest without being in danger or in a life threat that's the difference so the the space of immobilization is one of the most vulnerable spaces in the nervous system and it's really hard to reach that sometimes. And we can easily drop out of this state um, into, for example, the shock or faint space. So we can, with the wrong impulses from the outside, we can switch from one side to the other. But we cannot switch back. If people ending up in the faint or in the shock space, they have to go through the sympathetic why that is is Porges is talking about that um, in his book about the um, the vagal break so that between the ventral vagus and the dorsal vagus the switch from one to another we have to go through the limbic system through the sympathetic we cannot bypass our sympathetic nervous system to go back into a state of safe regulation and social engagement. So we need to activate our limbic system, our feelings, our emotions to express it. So the next state is we can easily drop from the mobile, mobile uh, from the immobilization into a fight and flight mode. And we cannot go from fight flight into the place of immobilization or the bliss state. We can switch between mobilization and the collapse. Imagine an accident. Yeah. Um, I've, I've heard about stories, I have not seen it or experienced that, but I've heard about stories, people breaking their legs in an accident and then they're just like, keep on walking and, 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 uh, or moving and then someone's saying, well, just have you, have you seen your leg that's poking a bone out? And they have not seen it, they have not felt it. And then they see it and then they, poof, they collapse. So the nervous system has not been keeping up. So, so you can easily 
um, go from mobilization into shock and faint and accident. And this is where the, where the beauty is. You can as well go from shock, faint, collapse into mobilization. So this is where any kind of yoga, dance, sport, physical, emotional therapy is important for people um, to change a state. So the way how Paul just describes that, that every state that you know of that can be sleeping, eating, dancing, fainting, um, everything you can imagine is a neurological state that can change from one neurological state to another neurological state. And that's just the question, how? And I imagine the question how, this is where it becomes really interesting into the skill set that you individually have as a practitioner. And the skill set is that where you provide your service, what you have. This is where you help people to change their neurological state. So people come into a session with a certain intention or they don't know yet and you find with them what their intention is for the change of a neurological state they might be looking for. And then, of, of course, you can switch back between the sympathetic mobilization and fight flight. Uh, for example, uh, people having an agreement about something in a sport event, <coughs> and then there is a, 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 a violation of a rule, and people start fighting, and then somebody is um, repairing and uh, and they're having the agreement, and then all of a sudden they can play again, and the story is over. And so, so, so every arrow that you see here is a change of a neurological state. And you can put that in dysregulation, in co-regulation, or in self-regulation. So then one important piece is, and this is why it is so exciting to me, is um, that Paul just talks about that. In the social engagement uh, system, when you save between social engagement and mobilization, there's a so-called hybrid state. And this hybrid state is that state where your frontal lobe, your neocortex, your noticing brain is part of where you can make choices. So where you can intune what's going on and where you can change your mind based on A, your desire, what you want, your limits or your boundaries at any time. So when I talk about empowerment, this is where I try to guide people into that hybrid state so that they can make embodied empowered choices about the desire they have and what they want. And if people don't know that, I help them and let them find how that feels in their body to express what they want. And I just go into that uh, a little bit later. So in this hybrid state, this is where the uh, somatic consent engagement system is happening. So where we're creating agreements um, or consent through agreements and permission. And in this engagement system, this is where session work is happening. Yeah, so we need to be capable of, as a practitioner, having the overview about A, in which neurological state we are in. And we have to be capable of being attuned in which neurological state the client is in and what is their desired outcome in which neurological state they want to be. All right. Okay, so um, I'm ready for some questions and answers at that point. Um, let's have about five minutes or something. And please unmute yourself if you have a question. You can just push the long, um, um, uh, 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 what's that, the tap bar on your keyboard and then you unmute yourself and when you put the hand off you mute it again so you don't have to mute and unmute yourself on the microphone you just click it and unclick it then you mute it and unmute it if you want to say something or ask a question please feel free now
does it resonate what I explained about the nervous system? Does it make sense to you? Yeah, is it easy enough or is it complicated? Please jump in if you have anything. You can share how you feel in your body right now. I think there was a question in the chat there, Matt. Oh, thanks, Marco. Uh, to differentiate if someone is in immobilization or freeze. Um, great question. So the difference between immo immobilization and freeze is in freeze, people cannot make choices. In freeze, people have difficulties to remember where they are physically in the space and time. People cannot express desire, they cannot share limits, and they have no access to their emotional body. There's a state of dissociation and they're literally out of their body. In immobilization, you can immediately, you know, even if your eyes closed, or, or you just talk to somebody and their eyes is closed and you ask them just, um, hey, how are you doing? What's your name? Just like, okay, my name is Dalida, so don't ask me. So, so in the place of immobilization, so in this bliss state, you have access to your speech center and you can make choices at any time. In the other side, in the freeze response, you're out. You're gone. Yeah, does it answer that question? Okay, another question. Yeah, Matt, I have a, I have a question. And then uh, my question you. is, can you hear me? I hear you very well, yes. Uh, my, my question is actually, are there uh, certain things you uh, look for when the client walks in the door to gauge where they at in, the, in this whole nervous system uh, story? But I think you specifically look for, like I, this body language tells me they're in this part of the system, this, their way of engaging me or talking to me tells me that they're in this part of the system. Um, yeah, great question. What, what I say is that as a practitioner, everything is an assessment. I mean, it depends on what kind of sessions you do. So everything is an assessment. And <clears throat> the question is, um, how do you assess people? So um, before somebody's walking through my door into my session space, I at least had an email connection with them. Some of them, I have a Zoom call like we do. Some of them um, I met somehow before or um, you have a phone call with them. So everything is an assessment, even when I ask people to write down in their own way their um, intention for a session, that this might change when they come to a session. So when they come into a session, they have a complete different intention than they had before when I asked them, what's your intention for that session? So, so the assessment of where they are at is a constant ongoing part of you that is changing all the time. So assessing a person is pretty much based on um, feeling into them and being there for them where they are. And um, uh, reading them. So it's constant assessing. So there was, an, and I see there's one question about fawning. Um, then there is, I think Tony had his hand up and then uh, Anshal. So let's start with Tony. Yeah, I just wonder, could you like relate this map to the window of tolerance and where you have hyperarousal and hypoarousal? Yes. So the window of tolerance is, is a similar dynamic than the polyvega theory and, um, um, and makes, it, makes it actually simple. And I, I think personally it's not as complete as the polyvega theory. So, so the, the, the hyper state is literally the sympathetic in the not safe side of the nervous system. Hypo, no, that's a hype. Yeah, that's a hyper. And the hypo state, hyper. Oh, I, I just confused at the moment. Hyper, 
hyper is the active state and hypo is the thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you thank you so 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 you find the hypo and the hyper state in the not safe side of the nervous system and the window of tolerance you literally find on the safe side of the nervous system and then you have the so-called zone of equilibrium in there so if you're only in the in the in the window of tolerance you don't evolve you just like hang out in the comfort zone but you now neurologically we want to go into the edges of our neurological expression to dive deeper into our capacity and um Yeah, there's, there's, there's another picture to the um, window of tolerance to cause the zone of equilibrium. This is literally the zone where you evolve and develop. And if you go too far, you're ending up in hyper or hyper. And so it's literally you have one foot in and one foot out. If you have both, both feet out in hyper or hypo, you're literally, you're literally gone on survive. Yeah. And I imagine being in the zone in the zone of equilibrium this is on the safe side where you just kind of stick your toes over to the not safe side but you you know that you can actually explore and discover because you can come back on the on the survival mechanisms just like when you on survive you on survive there's nothing going on in your brain then actually get yourself in in the mood of safety again okay and then there was uh, ansha Hi, this is all all new all new to me. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you well. Yes. Yeah. Um, my question was uh, how to assess uh, when a person uh, or what are the what are the stages from where a person can can go from immobilization to a fight or a flight mode or a hide mode. What are the cases in this in situations when this can happen? Um, you know, people can die of shock, and that can ha when, happen when people are really relaxed and when they're really expanded in this in this void place, and you just like fire a cracker, and there's a big bang. The nervous system can completely so people completely f they, they, they 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 faint, yeah. So. So this is what's coming in my mind. I mean, I've, I've had that a few times in my life with my kids when just like you just come around the corner, not thinking of anything bad. And then all of a sudden they just like scare you. Yeah. So this is, this is a classic. And then, oh, oh, and then you just actually, okay, that was just my kid just trying to play. But you know, if you just walk pretty easy and relaxed on the beach and, and then somebody's jumping out of the bush and just kind of just like want to just like get over you, then you probably kind of just like go into the um, uh, animal kind of when they, when they get caught into this uh, light, uh, uh, what does it call, bolt when, on, on, on the street. I, it's just like my English, just like leaves me. You, you know what I mean? Just like when you when when an animal walks over the street it's getting kept by by a car and the the animal goes automatically in the free state not to move because it it's a dangerous situation and that can happen if you're getting overly scared you don't run you just actually go into that state of shock and freeze deer in the headlight thank you <laughs> that was it so, and then there was another question um, that was, what about fawning in that space? I have to say, and I don't want to say that here because it feels embarrassing. The word fawning has just left my awareness. Are you willing to explain fawning for us, Luis? You asked that question. Yeah, fawning is uh, another, um trauma response to fight, flight and freeze, but it's where someone can be verbal and they become hyper people pleasing. Um, okay, yeah. Counting their need and in order to get through a period of time until they can get to safety. All right. But yes. in a specific response. Yes, thank you. Um, I guess or imagine that uh, uh, is similar with the word of appeasing that I know of. 
right? So this is what I know as a piecing. Um, it is the, and I imagine part of what I know as the Stockholm syndrome, kind of just um, trying to make friends with the, um, with, the, with, with the perpetrator, befriend them to um, be liked. Yeah. And, and I think that all kind of um, oppressions in the form of isms like sexism, um, uh, patriarchy, uh, patriarchy, any kind of isms are home there in this specific form of um, appeasing. And um, it's a good question. I think mostly important is to empower people to let them know that they have choices and that any kind of pushing people into decision is not making choices. So let people find their way of making choices and doing it in small steps, small choices. All right, last question here. Um, what is the easiest way to help shift someone from fight or flight? Um, well, I would say if somebody is really in fight or flight, um, I would actually uh, acknowledge them, run away, because if there is a tiger, <laughs> I would highly tell them, run. <laughs> um, if somebody is in a constant state of fight and flight and in an environment where it's safe, um, it's probably to acknowledge that there is a state of fight, flight. Um, then what I have found, what is pretty helpful is uh, uh, David Pacelli's work, TRE. So I've seen that with people who are constantly in this kind of hyper state where they are hyperactive and doing their, all this kind of move, just do about 10 TRE sessions and your nervous system is just like in a good space. Normally comes what I would say from a kind of an traumatic experience a while ago, carried through life. All right, um, kind of Stockholm syndrome, yes. Pleasing and lying with what we perceive as the enemy. Yes, thank you very much. So let's go into the next state of my little demonstration here. And um, this is the place of empowerment. And I'm very passionate about that. And, uh, and it's super simple. And um, but on, let's see if that resonates with you. So normally, as a practitioner, we are the giver. And as the giver, we have inherited this belief that when we give, we are in action. So that when we're giving and we have the skill set of our of our work embodied, um, we think that the action is the most important thing. And we just have to go into the place of action to prove as the giver that we are useful. And when we think that as a giver, the action is the most important point in session work, then we have missed the entire spectrum of empowerment already. So if this is the receiver, then I would say empowerment is that choosing <clears throat> is more important than the action. So that it's not about what the action is towards the other person, that it's about that they choose what the action is. And not we putting our idea of that action onto them. Because as a giver, as a practitioner, as the expert, we know what is best for them. And I think this is a big misconception and mistake as a practitioner. No, we don't. They know what is best for them. And our work is to let them find what is best for them. That's in my interpretation. So there's a, there's a magical formula 
to empower people. And this formula is super simple. All what they need is enough time to create safety in their nervous system that they can notice what they want, that they can trust what they want, that this is important, that they can value that and communicate it. So when somebody has enough time and they're safe enough, they notice, trust, value, and communicate about their desire and what they want. Okay, I hope everybody can see that. Yeah, so that the receiver is the one who needs to find what they want and what their desire is. So when they can, exp when they find that, and they can, they can communicate what they want, there are only two ways of action the receiver can communicate. Either they are asking for, can I do such and such, so that they can go into an action for themselves, or they ask, can you do such and such? So that receiving, to come back in the first place, what I said about the wheel of consent and the somatic consent engagement system, is that the receiver can go into an action for their own benefit. And that needs a permission. So we need to let a person find, it depends on if this is part of your session offering, we need to let the person find what their desire is by that action. Now here comes the tricky part. We can only let a person find their desire of their own action as deep as we have embodied our own desire through our own action. If we're feeling embarrassed, if we're feeling shame, or if we're feeling guilty, or it is wrong to go in an action for ourselves as a practitioner in a private setting or anywhere else, we cannot let another person find that. So we can only guide a person as deep as we have gotten ourselves. Does it resonate? Yeah? Okay, I see a few heads up. So, now, here comes the point. So when, when we don't do the, when we don't prioritize the action as a giver and we let the other person find what they want, and just maybe you have a one-way touch practice so that you are in action, then you just let them find one question or one request and that's that, that they say, hey, actually today I feel a little bit kind of um, busy. I just need some really deep tissue massage and can you just massage my entire body or can you just put your hand on my belly or could you just look in my eyes and listen to me for half an hour because I have an emotional thing, I need to cry or whatever there is so that they can request to us what they need. That's the first step of empowerment. If you have a one-way engagement in your session work. I have two-way touch or two-way engagement and that's a different thing and I might have enough time to talk about that, I'm not sure. But the point is when you let a person find what they want and they're fully empowered and they say something, okay, I want this and I want that and that sounds, and, and, and this is exactly what I, wanted, what I want you to do today, then, here comes the second step for you as a practitioner. You have to go through the same process. You have to have enough time to feel safe enough to notice, to trust, to value and to communicate what your limits are and what are you willing to. And that pretty much depends on how you frame your session work. If you have somebody in a session, you know, tell you an example, when I had that a few years ago um, uh, in a session where I was working with a, with a male client, uh, a homosexual, and then he said, just like, yeah, you know, uh, I want, first I want you to just give me a really delicious penis massage, and then I wanna have sex with you. 
and my entire body goes just like kind of just like shit and now i have to provide that because a he found what he wants and i as a provider don't have to have limits i have to just like be capable for everything and there are two things here as a practitioner first is if you let the other person want uh, find what they want you have to do these two things simultaneously first you have to put your desire aside and let them find what they want because your desire doesn't count and you have to respect your limits and if you don't respect your limits and you give from a place of appeasing or you give from a place of want to make it right and you want to prove that you are a good practitioner and you override your own limits you actually don't give a gift to them that's neither that's neither beneficial for them nor for you as a practitioner so you need to know what your limits are and you let them find what they want and there is a meeting point in between that pretty much depends on what is the nature of the session that you offer so when you as a practitioner can communicate that then depends on either you say yes i can do such and such or yes you can do such and such so that you can give a, a, a client permission for example if the client would ask hey may i just like lean next to you and may i cuddle you for example yeah so so that that you feel okay um, yeah i'm i'm good with that so how long do we do that five minutes yes you can lay next to me you can cuddle me for five minutes i'm, I'm good with that um so so that there are two different dynamics here one of them either they go in an action for what they want or you go in action for what they want and in both cases you have to have your limits clear and what are you willing to provide and that can change on a daily basis. that can change with clients and that can change even with the same client so what your limits are is as important as they find what they want so if this is clear then it can be either your action for them or it is can or it can be their action for themselves okay let's see where we are here um, so this is again where the somatic consent engagement system fits in and where um, the engagement zones and the four ways of touch becomes really obvious because this is all there is it's either your action it's for them or it is their action it is for them but there's a little bit more than that um, but this is the raw format of engagement so i don't know how far we are so so when we know how to choose we can let clients choose what they want within our limits so i explained that i don't have to say it again and so this is how i see empowerment so empowerment is what the teaching is all about it's in order to let somebody else find receiving and to let somebody else finding receiving we have to fully embody receiving first so in order to put aside what we want we have to first know what we want to be able to put it aside so um i said that in the beginning so that the key of the entire work of the somatic consent engagement system is based on two different things to find that in your nervous system and find that with other people and this piece will make all the difference and this is what the practitioner training that i'm offering is mainly providing that as a practitioner that you find your inflow first so your direct route of pleasure so that you know how it feels and how to show people how it feels to make a choice about something that is neurological in their nervous system 
So when you have found that, and when you can ask for what you want and you have broken through your own, uh, let's say obstacles of feeling yourself on somebody else, then you can provide that to clients that they can allow themselves to feel themselves on you if you would provide that or if they have found that themselves then they have something they can ask for you to do to them so that the that the first the first neurological dynamic in the nervous system is the direct route where you can feel yourself where the secondary route what most people literally do so that there's going all this action and getting a response um, to being appreciated, acknowledged, and being um, uh, proven as the right and perfect practitioner so that this entire secondary route um, where we do something to get a response, we can intentionally harvest and use that as the capacity of tuning in to other people where they are for their sake, for their dynamic. So um, I just want to see how fast I want to click to that because there's just a half an hour left. Uh, no, 50 minutes left. So um, um, I think that's too little time. I just want to go through another dynamic here. What is the the armoring map? So I'm as well a practitioner of physical de armoring. And um, what the armoring literally is, is that, um, no, 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 I just share from another place. So I call that the zone in the zone. So when we are practitioner and we are in this place of the apex and we are in the place of empowered and embodied in this dynamic of the direct route so that we can tune into other people, let's say that there is an engagement zone in this dynamic on top of that. So that when you are in dynamics for the other person, that you can literally provide all four dynamics because you know where you are neurologically and you can provide for other people what they want to find for themselves because you have found it already. And that doesn't happen in the dynamic here of the engagement zones, that happens above that as if the same dynamic is above for them again. Does that make sense? Kind of you kind of getting, getting this idea about that? For example, when it comes to the armoring, so when it comes to the armoring that when we pushing pressure point on other people's bodies to get their um, emotional body going, yeah, so they wanna get tension out of their body, they cannot ask for exactly what they want. They cannot express that and specifically when you have a, a certain modality or technique or skills, a client cannot tell you what they want you to do to them because they don't have the skills. They don't know what they don't know and so they can't ask for that. Um, there's somebody unmuted. Can you talk to yourself? I don't know who that is. Okay. Okay, good. So therefore, with your skills and with your capacity as a practitioner, you have a lot of power. And you might be true that you know what is best for them. And when you know what is best for somebody else, then you don't come from that place within the wheel of consent, for example, because you have to come from an embodied empowered place where you guide people into their 
best benefit what they want to get out of that. And that makes as well, this is as well making offerings. So when I tune into you and listen to you and feel into your nervous system, I think you could benefit from such and such. Does it resonate with you? Would you like to try that? And so there's another part that calls it the empowerment massage where the important piece of the social engagement system of eye contact and verbal connection with a client is super, super important. So for example, if you press, uh, uh, push a pressure, pressure point and you are connected with their response, you don't want to cause harm or a shutdown in their body, in their nervous system. You only want to tune in with them to that point where they can release tension out of their body. And that's true for all body parts. Okay, so um, enough of that. So that's much, there's much more to that. So I just want to um, share that briefly. So then there's an important piece as well. What I share in the practitioner training is that there's a difference between the treatment model and the model of co-creation. And that pretty much depends on what kind of practitioner you are. Either you operate in the realm of giving a treatment, that means you operate from place A to B to C for a certain outcome. For example, when you have a, a specific model, for example, a time massage, yeah, you work A, B, C, and then you just work till the end. So that's a treatment model. Or you have the co-creation model that works with empowerment. But there's no black and white between them because there's a big spectrum between treatment and co-creation. And that pretty much depends on where you are at and how much skills you have and how much of empowerment you want to provide for somebody else. I had an example. I had, I had a person coming to a massage once and, um, and I asked, so what would you like? And yeah, um, I just want to feel pleasure. And then I just went into this place of the co-creation kind of piece of coaching. So what's pleasure to you? Uh, yeah, I don't know. And so I let them find the direct route and then I just, just guided them through this entire process. And then after half an hour, <laughs> this person said to me, I just want to have a massage. So they just wanted to have a treatment and I have not gotten that fully. So, so um, an important piece is that we cannot heal somebody with a treatment who needs empowerment and we cannot empower somebody who is there for a treatment. You know, if somebody has a broken arm and this arm needs to be fixed and kind of just like put in a, in, a, in, in, in the right position, you know, you, it, it doesn't mean much to them if you empower them how to walk down the street and not falling down the hole. So it's just like, they are both important and important is to know when to use what and being in tune when is what necessary. Then I would like to share on this point the links. So as you see, the first link that I sent you here is about uh, my individual session offerings. So you find them on Calendly. Um, when you click there, there's a 15 minute um, discovery call as well as supervision session for individual practitioner. Um, I do so-called um, bliss sessions or emergency sessions and as well in-person sessions here in Stockholm if you want to come here or if you're here, so I'm available for that. The second one is the handbook. And in the handbook, there is um, um, not, not all of that that I've shared today, um, um, but most of that. So you can download that handbook, it is for free. Um, uh, have a read, watch the, uh, the maps, download, uh, 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 no, watch the, watch the videos and uh, just ask questions if you like. And then I have two practitioner trainings coming up. One is in uh, Stockholm, 16 to 19 of July. Uh, click, click that link here. It's a special price compared to the one in Berlin um, because I don't have to pay a rent. I have an amazing space here where I can offer the workshop. And um, then the one in Berlin, it is 20, uh, 20th to 23rd of August. Uh, 
I have rented an amazing space and some of you in here come already. I'm really excited about that one. And um, any questions, anything you would like to know at this point of time? So if a client expressed their desire, it's of bounds and you reject, reject their request and they get disappointed or angry, do you cancel the session? Oh, that's a good question. So important is that I don't let people find their desire in an, in an intake. What I want people to find in an intake is their intention. And an intention is absolutely, utterly welcome, whatever it is. So that you, as I said, that you might have an intention in the beginning or before a session, and then in the session, you have a complete other intention. And I invite you to change that at any time. Or even you have a, uh, uh, an intention before a session and then in the beginning and then during the session, your intention changes. I invite you to change that and change your intention. Important here is that if I let somebody find their desire and what they want, that I don't make them wrong about their desire. I acknowledge their desire. I say, well, that sounds really exciting. Well, it's really great that you asked for that and it sounds really good and I'm not available for that. So part of sexual empowerment session with women that I have is one of the deepest levels of empowerment I, I could find, and it comes from Bert Hellinger's systemic work, is that a woman can ask in a session to have sex. And when a woman can ask this desire in a session, that I will acknowledge that desire, and I say that sounds really delicious and beautiful, and I respect your desire, and I'm not available for that one. Sorry, I cannot provide that, but it sounds really delicious. Anything else that I can provide. So important is not making them wrong. And, um, and if they're getting angry because they just want that, then I help them to express their anger. Okay, other questions. Um, and I just want to say that, so that was a question from Tony. I don't know if you male or female. I think that's different for male or female practitioner who working specifically for me, female practitioner working with male. So I'm in the, in the privileged position of a white male and I don't have to be afraid of women asking. So I can, I can, I can express my limits pretty clearly. But that's not always true for women. Uh, what about if uh, uh, is us as a practitioner is going into freeze mode in reaction or certain to certain clients? Um, I like to say it that way. I like to create metacognitive moments. And if you lose it, I mean, if you really lose it, if you just go into freeze mode with a client, if you lose it, then you have some work to do. So I highly recommend every practitioner having supervision sessions or having any kind of coaching with other practitioner that are your mentor and constant, constantly educate yourself. So don't stop learning, important here. Um, if you're in the freeze mode or if you notice you're just shutting down something is going really south for you, um, I notice that about myself, I can go in a kind of a default mode. And either I have to, I have to stop the session or um, I bring the session to a completion and then I process somewhere else. I don't process in a session. Super important, never ever process your personal stuff in a session. It's not for you, it's for them. And if you can't um, uh, contain that, then um, yeah, do some work. That's, that's an important piece. Uh, never stop learning. All right, any other questions?
and I invite you for a moment to lean back, close your eyes. <sighs> Exhale till the end of the out breath. Till breathing just happens again by itself. Inhale all the way and give it a sigh when you breathe out. Just do that in your own speed, your own time, a few times. And then feel into your body about this 90 minutes of sharing, talking, listening. And feel how that resonates in your body. How's How's it resonating in your body? So there's nothing right or wrong. It's just exactly as it is, perfect as it is. And I invite you to take everything that resonates with you and everything that doesn't resonate, just maybe put it on an etheric bookshelf or revisit it later. And then again, feel into what resonates with you and what is your main takeaway from that webinar what are you grateful for not grateful for me but the feeling of being grateful for something that resonates in you that belongs to you and i invite you either to write it in the in the chat or unmute yourself if you have one or two or a few words. I feel more space in my body. Express whatever you want to say to bring it into completion for you. And if you don't have to say anything, then that's good for me too. Ah, so thank you very much, each and one of you for showing up today. I really appreciate that. So it's one of my main topics working with practitioners because I see every practitioner as an ally and we can learn so much from each other. So I know stuff that you don't know and you know stuff that I don't know. And um, grateful to know the Pauli Vega theory. Yes, it's a good one. Um, so the training that I offer is to know each other, to share our vulnerability, and finding receiving on the deepest level that you can let other people find their receiving. So it is about your receiving in this workshop. Thank you very much, have a beautiful day. And please feel free to reach out and ask questions anytime if you have to or want to, all right. Goodbye.